You're watching The Sharp Angle. I'm Leslie Picker. 2022 has been a tough year for tech investors. The prospect of higher interest rates changing the equation for high growth, profitless companies, causing a sell off in a large swath of them. Ulrike Hoffman Bucardi is braving the turbulence. She is the manager of T, an equity long short strategy within Tudor Investment Corporation. She's focused on technology and disruption. Ulrike, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Leslie, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. What's it like being a tech investor right now, given this whole regime change that's really gone on in the market? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, maybe let me break it into two parts. One is, what is it like to be a technology investor? And then secondly, what is going on right now? Um, so in terms of technology, we have this exciting doorstep of a next generation of digital transformation, one that is fueled by data. Um, we predict that data is going to grow more than 100 times over the next 10 years. And this gives rise to tremendous investing opportunities in data infrastructure, in semiconductors, but also in digital and data first businesses. So lots to be excited about. And then to the second part of your question, what is going on right now? It's less to do with the prospects of these new technologies, but the fact that we have come off unprecedented levels of fiscal and monetary stimulus. And that has led to inflationary pressures in our economy that now the Fed seeks to rein in with higher rates. And so with that backdrop, um, everything else being equal, this means lower equity valuations. So we are discounting future cash flows with higher discount rates. But I think one thing it's important to recognize is that this tide of fiscal and monetary stimulus has lifted all boats, not just technology. And it's interesting to see what is still floating when this tide recedes. Um, and here's who I still see standing. Those companies with strongest secular tailwinds, the best business models, and world-class leadership. And I think it's hard to find another sector that has so much of all of these. So, so maybe another way to put it is that the Fed can change the discount rate, but not the digital inflection of our economy. So as you see these valuations come down um, pretty sharply, at least in the near term, does that concern you? Are you seeing that as more of a buying opportunity? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. If you actually look at these sharp asset price corrections that we have seen, you can look at them and try to invert what these different asset classes price in, in terms of future rate hikes. And so if you look at high growth software in particular, this now prices in a 1% increase in the 10 year rate. Whereas if you look at the Dow Jones, it is still at a 0% rate hike. So it does look like there's at least some diversity um, of risk being priced in. And it sounds like right now, maybe um, the sharp corrections in high growth software have at least in the short term, more to do with positioning and flows than actual fundamentals. So do you think they will correct themselves then? I ask because uh, Paul Tudor Jones of, of your firm uh, recently said that the things that have performed the best since March 2020 are probably going to perform the worst as we go through this tightening cycle. By and large, that's been high growth technology where you um, spend the most of your time and, and look into these areas. So do you agree with that? And does that kind of concern you on the long side? Yeah, so, so, so let me start with um, Paul is unrivaled as a macro investor, and, and I say that both with the data lens um, of his track record, um, but also a personal bias. Um, so maybe unsurprisingly, I do share the same framework. Um, the Fed has changed its null hypothesis on monetary policy. So they're going to hike, hike rates until the data strongly suggests otherwise, which would be inflationary expectation coming down closer to 2%, the equity market significantly, significantly selling off or the economy slowing down. So we have to prepare ourselves for an environment with higher rates. And as you mentioned, those stocks that have cash flows that are further out into the future are more vulnerable than the one, ones with near-term cash flows. Um, so with that backdrop, you have to adjust your playbook. And I do think in technology and equity investing in particular, um, there are still opportunities to um, 
make profitable investments in individual companies. Um, even if valuations are coming down, if companies outperform their growth rates, um, they can offset that multiple compression. Um, and there's particular companies that are indexed to the amount of data growth. It, it's not that data is going to stop growing just because the Fed stops growing its balance sheet. And then secondly, um, as I just alluded to, there could be tactical opportunities when certain asset classes overreact in the short term. And then lastly, the data also shows that it's actually sharp increases in rates that are more harmful to equities than higher rates overall. Um, so now that we are pricing in four rate hikes this year, at least the pace in, of increases in interest rates should start to slow down for the rest of the year. So I, I would summarize that you know, there's still two opportunities to deliver alpha. One is stock selection, and then the second one is technically adjusting your hedges when things over on direct in the short term. So given that backdrop that you described, Ulrika, what does that mean about whether technology is currently sitting at its fundamental basis? And does that give you more confidence to be a buyer in this market? Yeah, maybe um, to start with as fundamental investors with a long-term horizon, our first premise is to stay invested in the companies that we believe are going to be the winners of this age of data and digital. Um, so it's all about hedging and you know, hedge funds tend to get a bad rep because they're so short-term focused. But in fact, hedging can allow you to have staying power in your investments for the long term. And so in this environment, if you want to hedge out the duration risk of your cash flows, the easiest way is to offset your long-term investments with maybe a basket of stocks that have similar duration of cash flows. Um, however, having said that, I think the risk reward of hedging these high growth names with other high growth names probably has come down considerably, given that we have seen one of the largest and most furious corrections um, in high growth software over the last 20 years. So it's more about then tactically adjusting your hedges if you believe that certain assets may have overshot um, in this environment where others have not um, appropriately reacted. So what sectors are you interested in on the longer side and what sectors on the short side? Yeah, so on the on our long term thesis on data and digital, which we are still very early in this in this new um, era of transformation. Um, there are really two sectors that are very interesting. One is data infrastructure and the other one is semiconductors. And, um, you know, in a sense, this is very much the picks and shovels strategy of the digital age, very much like in the gold rush of the 1840s. And <clears throat> it's all about software and hardware to translate data into insights. And so for semiconductors, um, which is a very interesting industry, they're the digital engine room of our economy, the digital economy. And it has an industry structure that is very benign, and actually has gotten better over the years, actually the number of publicly traded semiconductor companies has come down over the last 10 years. And the barriers to entry in semiconductors have increased um, across the whole value chain. But even the design of a ship, if you go from 10 nanometers to five nanometers, has increased by three times. So very um, benign competitive framework against an end demand that is now accelerating. Even if you look at, for instance, the automotive industry, there, we're going to see semi-content increasing by more than five times over the next 10 years. And then on the data infrastructure side, it's also very interesting. It's a very nascent market. Only about 10% of software is currently data infrastructure software. And as companies have to deal with new and large amounts of varied data, they will have to overhaul the data infrastructure. Uh, and it's incredibly sticky. It's like building a foundation of a house, um, very difficult to rip out once installed. So both of these sectors index to the amount of data growth, um, but are very complementary. One again is the engine room of the digital economy and then software, the instruction manual to translate data into actual insights. And how about on the short side, how do you see the best way to hedge what's going on right now in the market? 
Yeah, I think it's more hedging the risk of higher interest rates as opposed to hedge out fundamentals. And so it's just about matching cash flow duration patterns. Um, but again, I think at this point, um, we are probably overdone on some of the growth software sell off. Um, and it's more about going into hedges that now um, help you price in maybe an overall slowdown on the index level, much more so than in those particular areas of technology. Interesting. So hedging indexes, perhaps, just as a, a way to protect the downside of, of the longer bets that you're doing. Yeah, at least in the short term, where we have seen most of the carnage in in, in some pockets of the market, but others have not really reacted to this higher rate environment. I have to ask you about IPOs, because as a technology investor, that's been a huge source of alpha for the last few years. Mm -hmm. 2021 was a, a huge sea change there with most IPOs trading underwater. And now the, the IPO pipeline looks somewhat limited going into 2022. How do you view this market do you think that that was a reckoning that was a long time coming, or do you think that ultimately it will correct itself and there will be opportunity again there? I think there's no doubt that the IPO market will slow down this year. Um, it's not so much a function of the quality of the IPO pipeline, but rather the fact that it takes time to adjust to new realities. And, you know, we have seen, especially in software, which is probably 90% of the tech IPO pipeline, now a drastic reset in valuations, more than 40% in a little over 40 trading days, um, one of the largest corrections over the last 20 years. So if you are an IPO ready company, you have one of two choices, either you're going to wait and grow into your multiple over time, or you're going to try to go public now at a substantially lower valuation. And even that second choice will take time. You have to get buy-in from your board, recent shareholders that may be underwater um, with this new valuation level. So I think it's clear that this valuation reset has put a spoke in the wheel of new issues. But I do think this will change very quickly once valuations recalibrate. Uh, the pace of innovation is accelerating, and I think the appetite to be invested in the winners of the future is unabated. Um, and I think lastly, the highest quality companies can go public at any time. Um, I recall in 2008, Visa went public, was one of the largest IPOs at the time in one of the most challenging market conditions. Um, it was a big success. So quality does trump the market environment. What are you modeling in terms of valuations recal recalibrating? How long do you think it's going to take for this to all get sorted out? I think it's going to be a function of rates um, more broadly. So we have to see rates stabilize. I do think right now we have seen, at least in terms of the speed of the move, the vast majority seems to be behind us. I think we are going to slow down in terms of uh, rate increases going forward, and that helps think for, for equities to recalibrate and adjust, and again, focus on the economic fundamentals like earnings. Um, but as long as you know, the volatility in interest rate move is that large, it's going to be very hard for, for valuations to find and recalibrate itself. Um, and lastly, I just want to ask you about tech investing and ESG or environmental social governance, because you look at a lot of the ESG rankings, technology does consistently sit among the top relative to other industries. Uh, but how do you kind of think about this as an overlay to when you make decisions with regard to portfolio management? Um, yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, you're right that there is a handful of companies, especially on the larger cap side, that have pioneered their own ESG frameworks, like Applied Materials that has had a framework for well over six years and it's been a trailblazer in the space or even Microsoft um, with its own ESG framework on the software side. But I would say overall, the discussion of ESG in tech is still very early. And it's somewhat at odds with the size and the impact that the technology sector could and should have. Um, you know, from an investing perspective, I see ESG not as optional. It's a prerequisite for long-term success. Um, it's about best business practices, and lots of studies show that having a value-driven culture 
attracts the best talent, for example, it's very important, especially in technology, that it increases customer perception, translates into higher NPS scores, and also it is likely to lead to more benign regulatory outcomes. So I think there's a lot to look forward to uh, in technology and value creation as technology embraces ESG more broadly, uh, both for shareholders, but also for stakeholders more broadly. Excellent. Well, Ulrike, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, got a lot of valuable insights with, within this kind of very confusing and complex world of tech investing right now. So we appreciate you breaking it all down for us.